Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Newsroom. I'm your host, Mahal. But today is Monday, the 13th of November, 2023. And these are the stories that we'll be highlighting during the course of the show. We'll begin, ladies and gentlemen, with the latest update as far as the uh, Israel-Palestine uh, conflict is concerned. More than 11,000 people have perished, have been killed in this deadly massacre by the Israelis. And uh, the fact remains that, of course, a lot of developments are, are occurring uh, in the international arena, whether it be the OIC uh, special summit that happened in which uh, Pakistan also participated, uh, in which different important events were highlighted, including that the International Criminal Court uh, needs to uh, be more proactive against Israel in all the war crimes that it has perpetrated and of course other important decisions that were taken also the other important countries in the West are also trying for some kind of a pause or a ceasefire uh, to occur but more towards the pause is what the Western countries are uh, inclining uh, and at the same time a lot of uh, uh, people are displacing themselves uh, as well from Gaza, from one a part of Gaza to the other. The only people now that are left are mostly the youngsters, the children and the women and speaking of children uh, most of the casualties have also been children in this deadly conflict between these two sides the fact also remains that the hospitals are un not functioning as we speak a lot of hospitals are without the necessary equipment or even electricity to continue their services uh, other hospitals are being bombed upon if not the mosques if not the educational institutions so a very dire state of affairs as far as palestine is concerned but of course the onus of responsibility is entirely on the countries that can make that change or that can make you know, some kind of a ceasefire happen and a two-state solution, the implementation of it becomes even more paramount now. This is going to be our first segment. Our second segment, ladies and gentlemen, concerns the policy level talks between the IMF and Pakistan that have begun today. Uh, Shamshad Akhtar Sahiba uh, represents the Pakistani side and uh, the IMF side is also represented by their delegation. The fact also is that Pakistan has been diligently following uh, what uh, the IMF uh, conditions have been put forward as far as the S SBA is concerned. And uh, for the next tranche to be uh, released, it is important that Pakistan comply with all the conditionalities that the IMF has put forward. This is what is going to be part of the discussions that are going on between both the sides. The, at the same time, the KSE 100 index has also crossed a, a, a benchmark that had never crossed uh, hitherto, which is of course 56,000 mark. It has gained 1,132 points, which has never been seen before. I mean, the, the number, the 56,000 mark has never been achieved in the past in Pakistan's history. So, of course, that shows the, the, the confidence that uh, the business community has as far as the measures taken by the government are concerned. Then we'll be talking about uh, Kashmir, Indi illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, that endures decades of Indian oppression. And, of course, uh, the uh, anti-India protests continue in uh, different areas like Kargil, in Ladakh as well. Uh, but this, the fact also remains that uh, the barbarities that remind us a lot of what is happening in Palestine continue also in uh, Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, climate change and the smog that has kind of uh, taken over uh, India as well as in Pakistan. But here we are talking of India and how India's air quality has deteriorated uh, after Diwali. Three Indian cities, we just had New Delhi before, but now two other cities, Kolkata and Mumbai, have also add, been added to these uh, the, this uh, Indian capital city of New Delhi as being one of the most worst uh, or the worst pollutants as far as um, uh, this uh, air pollution is concerned. And the fact remains that this is extremely uh, bad for health purposes, whether it be um, you know, related to your lungs, whether it be related to your heart. So, of course, care needs to be taken by the respective countries. This is the lineup for today, ladies and gentlemen. Well, let's begin with our first, and that concerns what is happening in uh, Palestine in Gaza and uh, it is not just being restricted to Gaza there are also uh, casualties that are happening in the West Bank as we speak to discuss that and more we've been joined by Dr. Salma Malik she's an expert in foreign affairs and a long time guest so she returns to the studios after a long hiatus as, as far as newsroom is concerned thank you very much Dr. Salma Malik to have Thanks joined us uh, so Dr. Salma let's begin uh, with the uh, Gaza 11,000 plus uh, casualties and casualties that could have been avoided if uh, the right steps were taken or if some kind of talks were to happen. But apparently Israel is in no mood A of a ceasefire, B of any kind of talks. Mm -hmm. What is the ultimate end game that Israel has <coughs> in mind? Um, there has been a report recently which says that Gaza holds immense uh, natural resources, uh, primarily oil mm. and then of course gas as well. Um, and uh, when you look at this picture and the very fact that there is this 
plethora of um, global citizens, as well as countries concerned, who have been asking for ceasefire, restraint, not attacking sanctuaries. Um, and even if no one was doing that, in, in, in such wars, you're not supposed to attack sanctuaries, you're not supposed to kill babies, uh, and they're doing it, is not only symptomatic of this entire episode being genocidal, Israel just wants to wipe out Palestinians for, for good. They are not there, don't reduce their number, don't even send it to the other countries, just finish them altogether so that they never lay claim on their ancestral lands. And the second factor is that they are much into the political economy of what comes out of this episode. So this 11,000 number may mean a lot to you, it may mean a lot to me, it may mean a lot to a lot of other people, but not to them. But when you talk it, about it's still a small mm -hmm. number. When you talk of political economy and their version, the Israeli version <coughs> of it, what is their version? What do they want to achieve? I understand the gains through the oils and other resources that are present within Gaza, but is, is that it? Do you, will you massacre tens of thousands of people just because of oil or is there they, other resources? They have dehumanized the Palestinians. In their view, Palestinians are nobody. So they, they, need, to be par they need to be killed. They need to perish from their space. Mm. And... Uh, the way these things have unfolded over the years, plus the fact, if you recall, uh, the Israeli and the Indian leadership, once they met, and he proposed that you should Palestinize occupied Jammu and Kashmir, and that's precisely what they did, the unilateralism that came with it. So um, this is how um, leaders who are absolutely inhuman, they end up performing. You, you have very uh, strong prototypes, whether it is Modi, whether, whether it is Netanyahu. He has done this before. This is not for the first and time that he's doing it. Whenever but the Netanyahu comes in huge. power, Dr. Yes. Salma, whenever he's in power, there's something of this sort that happens. Absolutely. And there are various levels. At one level, it is Netanyahu's personal uh, fight because he wants to win the next elections. He had uh, popularity graphs which were tanking. They were not doing well at all. At the other level, he wants them to be out of this area so that he occupies them. And if you, you need to look at the pattern, how they've done this. And of course, I mean, when I was very young, I would listen to this uh, parents crying, the, the mothers crying and talking about the children who have been killed in the Shab Sabra Shatila uh, refugee camps. So this is not the first time that uh, young babies have been killed. They have been killed in sanctuaries and they continue doing this. And the impunity that they have and the confidence with which they carry out this impunity is also because they know that the, the US and the world lobby is there to support them. And they have a very strong grip. Um, you, you have seen the pattern where citizens are trying to ban Israeli products. But just look at the number of Israeli products. The major conglomerates are all Israeli backed. Jewish funded. Mm. So and it's not a Jewish thing, it's Israeli funded. Mm. So because they have such a strong grip over the world economy, that's why A, you see a lot of inaction happening. Secondly, you also see the fact that they, they had uh, joined hands with Muslim countries, mm. but at the same time, um, you find a lot of uh, traction in the Muslim countries now, the citizens, as well as now the countries in the OIC summit, where this conversation is becoming very unanimous and strong and the voice has become extremely loud about what to do with Israel. All right, now speaking Israel. of the OIC and the voice that is <coughs> becoming strong, let's talk about the ICC and the involvement of the ICC that has been pointed to uh, yes. during uh, the, the course of this uh, extraordinary OIC summit. Will the ICC get involved? Um, there are two things. Even if it gets involved, would it really do the speedy justice that is required in such a situation? And unfortunately, that would not happen. So even if the ICC gets involved, and I think a lot of our colleagues who are into lawfaring, they talk about the fact that uh, you need to tackle such issues through lawfaring. You mm. need to name and shame them, and you need to do a lot of uh, um, campaigning in that regard. But the very fact is that by the time um, such organizations actually take up an issue, mm. um, it is too late. Uh, we, we have seen the Congo genocide. Uh, in 90 days, 700,000 people were killed, and only then the UN moved its muscle. So no one could bring back those people. We have actually, in the case of the Jews of Israel, we have seen the Nuremberg trials taking place and the international courts not doing anything at all. 
and the Jews would say that this is too little, too late mm. at the end of the day. So it's just as denied, uh, de uh, denied and uh, delayed and just as denied. Mm. So the fact is that there is a need for an immediate action, an immediate cessation of these killings, an immediate cessation of this genocidal activity. All and right. unless and until, and I think OIC has tried to do a couple of things in this regard, they have asked for, you know, for this particular action. The second thing they've also moved, but Israel has thought it is, uh, having an oil embargo on Israel. And if that would have happened, Israel would have just immediately seized whatever they wanted to do. But just see how strongly entrenched they are into this entire global system that uh, it, it's very simple and easy for them to mm. uh, draw anything into inaction. The geopolitics of uh, the world has become extremely complicated Absolutely. and multifaceted. It is so complex that you cannot just look at it from one angle of the prism. True that. It is, you know, every has every single side has different sides to it. True. And it is so difficult to ascertain what is going to happen under the current circumstances that, you know, even during our discussion, we cannot really pinpoint as to what could or what what could not happen? You talk about, uh, you know, uh, the modus operandi. This is what you've mentioned as well. When you look at the protests that have also happened, the sacking of the uh, British uh, Home Secretary, yes. uh, that I think is a step in the right direction. Finally, somebody who was s foul mouthing a lot of, you know, uh, things uh, uh, against the Palestinians has been uh, given her due share. Sure. But the fact remains that this is just one person in a whole committee of uh, a plethora of uh, people, politicians and otherwise, who are uh, speaking the same voice. How sure. can that change? Can the people power change that? I hope so. One can only hope that this happens. I would also say that the people's power has motivated a lot of those Muslim countries who were not really doing too much. Mm. And they have all become unanimous. And the very fact that at the OIC summit, you have Iranians joining hands with Saudis mm -hmm. is so unprecedented. You just saw the Iranian leader. Exactly. Uh, coming and to that PSA. is a lot because the people's power has really prevailed in the countries. Mm -hmm. they, even if the countries were motivated to do things in their individual silos, uh, because of the fact that the people were so motivated, and this has nothing to do with sectarianism, this has nothing to do with ethnicity, it is because everyone is bleeding for the Muslim children of Gaza, the mothers of Gaza, the fathers of Gaza, the images where you have a father clinging to a child who is actually now stone cold mm -hmm. is something that, that doesn't require uh, a national ID code. It, you don't have to be of any country to realize the pain a father or the mother or the children are going mm -hmm. through and all that stuff. So that actually speaks for the fact that everywhere people are so motivated uh, that even the U.S. Biden, who who are, was the architect of all this mm. stuff, along with Netanyahu, is now giving statements which are in the right order. But they have the elections next year as well, so yes. they have to think in, so in have both to think uh, of terms as so well. So they did it. They did what they wanted to do, but now they are trying to play to the galleries, mm. even if they're lip syncing. Mm. But they're at least playing to the right tune. But you know, this playing to the tune or playing to the galleries will it have some kind of an effect, direct or indirect, short term or long term? Do you feel that the two-state solution? Because I've talked recently to a couple of <coughs> uh, Western diplomats, and they say that what they are insisting towards is toward is the implementation of the two-state solution. Is that a possibility? They say this, this is the time to implement it. Can it be implemented? But you see, the point is, uh, yes, it can be implemented. If there's a will, there, it can be implemented. But at the same time, what is going to be the composition of the state of Palestine hmm. when you would have a Gaza which has been raised to rubble? Hmm. So all you need end up is with two, three min uh, minor enclaves of the Palestinians hmm. disconnected from one another. So where would this actually take the state of Palestine? As we keep seeing those shrinking maps of Palestine and expanding Israel. So uh, Netanyahu wants that. At the end of the day, he would have a small city state known as Palestine if, if it was up to him. Mm -hmm. And um, either the complete exodus of Palestinians from their own indigenous homeland or confinement to very small spaces. Mm. So yes, at the at the end of the day, uh, he would agree to these things on his own ter uh, own terms and conditions. But the very fact is that uh, <clears throat> because now we have a very unified voice of OIC and we are calling it a genocide, uh, the UN, 
needs to listen to what is being said and not only listen, they have to actively listen. But how can they actively listen when in this, uh, you know, Security Council there is a veto power? Can that be changed in the long term? I think uh, the fact this happened, uh, there's unanimity. If we look at the composition of the Muslim countries, there's so many of them. They are very powerful countries. These are very powerful capitals. And you don't even now have a divided Muslim hand, a mm. Muslim house. Um, if the Muslim countries actually take an indirect route and start putting pressure on the allies of Israel, America, the Western capitals who have been supporting Israel, and they talk about embargoing oil or severing economic uh, mm. relations, it will make those capitals extremely worried. But and they would it, pressurize But shouldn't the this action happen uh, yesterday rather than even today? And yes, the fact also, yes, because as there's another angle to it, <coughs> and you have mentioned uh, it as well, is the exodus of the Palestinians. Absolutely. How many of the brotherly countries or neighborly countries will actually take in those That's hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, Palestinians f uh, away from their own land, away from the land where they've been living since generations? Uh, the fact is they will be immigrants, second or third class citizens in Absolutely. those countries. This will not be their country. You see, uh, that, that's the point. I mean, even at home in Pakistan, we have been talking about the, um, asking the illegal uh, Afghan hmm. um, Basically illegal foreigners, leave, including Afghans. Exactly. Illegal foreigners, hmm. including the Afghans. And people talk about, they immediately call them refugees. Hmm. And there's a lot of fine difference between who's an asylum seeker, who's a refugee, who's a migrant, mm. and who's an entirely illegal. So uh, these things happen, and one has to understand that it's not only to do with being Muslims, it's also to do with the fact that how much can a country cushion, right? I totally agree. And uh, already these countries have uh, a lot of refugee camps. They have a lot of people fledging to those countries. And uh, none of those countries are in a very perfect 100 out of 100 economic situation. True. They have their own crises, they have their own economic mm. issues, and then you have these people coming. Uh, when, when the war in Syria happened, Turkey's uh, demography and Turkey's uh, internal makeup change, uh, Turkey's internal makeup change to a very different, I mean, as foreigners, when you would go to Turkey, you would find it a very different country. So these things happen, they happen subtly, but they do happen. And that changes a lot of dynamics for the host country as well as for the migrants or uh, those who are seeking refuge. So, uh, and that has nothing to do with being Muslim or non-Muslim. These are very, very important aspects that need to be sit on the table and decided as to how to handle such mm. a huge humanitarian crisis, especially when people lose everything, including their life and blood, and they go to another country and there's hostility around. How would they cope with it? Uh, there's food crisis, there's health crisis, um, and so many things that are attached with that. So mm. uh, it's not going to be a very simple situation for the neighbor countries as well uh, when they are when they end up uh, cushioning so many uh, unfortunate Palestinians. And again, I think the OIC needs to meet again mm. and also decide about how to handle this humanitarian crisis, mm, the true. brass tax of Because it. a lot of the countries yes. that form part of OIC will be the countries that will be accepting, will be accepting uh, these uh, refugees. But the fact is, <coughs> there's a key word here, uh, Dr. Salma, I don't know whether you'd agree, is prioritization. There is a lack of that prioritization Absolutely. in global politics. When you see the Ukraine-Russia crisis and you Absolutely. compare it with the Israel-Palestinian crisis, there are so many uh, anomalies in Absolutely. the way that both the crises are being dealt with by the true. same countries. True. Uh, sh you know, shows a lot of aspects of what are the priorities of the West or the countries that matter across the world. Can organizations like the UN make that change? Can uh, is there is there a need of a new uh, regional coalition to come into effect in order to make that change? About the UN, I would say UN is what its members end up making it to be. You put more money in UN, they'll dance to you. My mm. apologies, they will mm. uh, listen mm. to you. Mm dance to your tune. Mm. Um, our countries like ours, our clout is how we qualitatively uh, perform for the UN or work with them. Uh, such countries, they have invested a lot in terms of monetary uh, benefits into the UN. And that really makes UN become mm. what it is. 
And that is why there's also, and then of course, they have invested in the countries which have the veto power. That also then, unfortunately, attributes to UN's inaction on a lot of matters. The UN Secretary General may be the person who really feels uh, from his heart and soul. But his hands are benefit, bound until and unless the UN Security Council exactly. is, uh, you know, has a unanimous NW. decision. So, uh, in terms of Ukrainian and Russian uh, conflict, mm. at least you see two sides fighting symmetrically, or even if non-symmetrically, mm. there is a support to the Ukrainians. In terms of Palestine, there is no fight from the other side. Exactly. I mean, Hamas performs uh, very episodically, and that is also something very, it seems if it's um, orchestrated. So I would actually, uh, even if I'm indulging in conspiracy, I would say that is really Hamas working for the Palestinians or is it working for the Israelis? Mm. Because the things seem very different. And each time there is something happening from the Hamas side, there's uh, 10, 100 times the response coming from Israel. And the end, uh, uh, unfortunately, the end user or the person who suffers are the Palestinians. Uh, so the Palestinians are not responding as mm. such. Mm. The Hamas is. Mm -hmm. That is part of the Palestinian mm. setup. Mm. But the common man, men are dying. The type of response the U.S. or the West made to Palestine, uh, to Ukraine, the point that you mm. have said, prioritization, uh, that, that that's not happening in You know, I will just give you an such. example. You know, when uh, Charlie Hebdo's uh, people yes. uh, passed away, the, the world leaders came together, oh, they yes. did a march oh, yes. together. You hand remember in that? Hand, hand in hand. Through the black where where are the world leaders? Now that uh, tens of thousands of people oh. are dying and people They're are the fleeing. Same. The voices are absolutely muted because mm. that's not a priority. It mm. doesn't matter to them. And mm. at the end of the day, perhaps all of them, unfortunately, may end up benefiting from uh, the Palestinians losing their homeland mm. and uh, Israel providing them with the type of benefits that they are looking at in the longer run. But you know who lo loses? Humanity loses, doesn't it? It's a war between the <coughs> oppressors and the oppressed and the oppressors are winning uh, big Humanity time. Humanity is just uh, folklore. <laughs> it's nothing more than that. It's well, only used as mm. and when it is required to justify our um, ends and means. It's mm. I, 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 I agree with you on that. Dr. Salwa Malik, thank you so thank very you much so to much have had this me. intellectual discussion because it was high time that we looked at different angles of this uh, this, this war, this conflict sure. that is engulfing more and more people into its arms with every passing day, more and more casualties that are happening and the way the, uh, the action or the lack thereof is uh, present shows a lot of, I don't know whether it is inaptitude, whether it is lack of will, whether it is something else that we might call, but it is a, it is a genuine failure of humanity as Absolutely. a whole to have stopped a genocide-like situation or genocidal situation within Palestine. I really wish, I really hope some kind of sense prevails, some kind Inshallah. of sanity prevails. I remain optimistic and I sh I'm sure you do as Inshallah. well and that we'll come to some kind of a ceasefire, not a pause because a pause means, you know, you just give them something to eat and th three days later they are being killed again. Thank you very much, Dr. Salma, to have joined us. Thank you so very much. Let's come to our second uh, story and that concerns the economic situation in Pakistan, whether it be the, the talks between the IMF and Pakistan or whether it be the ASC 100 index that has now a surpassed 56,000 mark. We've been joined by Ali Asghar Arba from Karachi to talk more about the PSX. Ali, thank you very much to have joined us. Ali, this is the first for Pakistan, isn't it? The 56,000 mark that has been crossed. How important is it for Pakistan and for Pakistan's economy? Yeah, thank you very much uh, uh, for attacking me. Uh, uh, actually, the Pakistan stock exchange is uh, performing uh, well since uh, weeks. And uh, today, uh, it is a historic day that uh, today the 100 points has uh, uh, crossed uh, 1,100 1, 100 points. And this is a big achievement that uh, Pakistan stock, uh, stock exchange index now uh, traded to do today uh, at uh, 56,500 more. So uh, th these are the big uh, achievement of the government initiatives because the, firstly the Pakistan stock exchange has itself has uh, introduced many reforms and uh, initiatives and the, secondly the government is taking um, many steps to strengthen the economy of the country. So you know that the, the uh, talks uh, with the uh, IMF is going uh, in a successful manner and similarly uh, in Pakistan there was a uh, political instability, but the, after the election commission has announced the date of the election in f uh, February, 
So uh, the political stability is now restored and all the political parties are doing their campaigns. Of course, these, this thing also uh, contributed a lot uh, to uh, perform the stock market in a better way. At the same time, uh, you know that the uh, government has uh, given the initiatives, especially uh, to the investors uh, abroad, especially Saudi Arabia and uh, Middle East countries and China and other countries. They are also government has initiated a lot of uh, confidence building measures and to facilitate the investors. So the investment from these countries is also coming in Pakistan. So that is also positive impact on the. Uh, a lot of good impact, uh, a lot of positive impacts, Ali, as far as Pakistan's economy is concerned, and we know the boom as far as the PSX uh, uh, index is concerned, or uh, the the BR index also, uh, 100, which has added 226.66 points. I mean, shows the A, the confidence that the business community has as far as Pakistan is concerned and its economy is concerned. B, it also shows the direction that is, in fact, the right direction that the government is taking. Thank you very much, Ali Azkar Arbab, to have joined us from Karachi to highlight and to give more details as far as the different factors behind this monumentous uh, increase as far as the PSX shares is concerned uh, has been witnessed today. And I hope and I really wish that in the coming days as well, we are going to see more increases as far as that is concerned. Thank you very much, Ali Askar Arbab. Let's come to our uh, guest in the studios who is waiting impatiently for our discussion to begin. He is another Dr. Manzoor Ahmed, he's a tra trade arbitrator with the WTO. Dr. Saab, thank you very much to have joined us. You look really savvy today. Uh, now let's uh, begin with the negotiations between the IMF and Pakistan that have, start, that have start begun today. Uh, Shamshad Akhtar Saiba is, uh, is leading the Pakistani side and from the IMF, there's a delegation from the IMF. Uh, what is going to be, in your point of view, uh, the basic gamut of uh, negotiations or talks this time between the two sides. Thank you, Khalisa. First, uh, your, your comment about me, I just tried, you were the host, so I thought <laughs> I should get, come properly dressed. Okay, uh, the gamut, I think after a long time, the, the government is in a comfortable position. The various targets set up for various uh, departments of the government, you just uh, spoke about 56,000 mm -hmm. stock market crossing. You know, I mean, have you ever seen this? this uh, uh, yeah, it was 45,000 mm -hmm. when the, uh, mm -hmm. and just, uh, you know, in no time it's mm -hmm. crossed more than 20% up. True. It, it's huge. Mm -hmm. And also a little bit recovery of uh, dollar to rupee mm -hmm. as well. So you see the, the gains are uh, substantial. Mm -hmm. It's not that the... Uh, you know, rupee has fallen. And what, and do you, what do you attribute these gains? Oh, to? I think I think lots of things. Now, let me give you two or three things. Fine. For example, on agriculture, mm. you have really good news after a long time. Mm. You have the, the, your big crop, cotton, which last year was only five and a half million bales. This year is at about eleven and a half million bales. That's more than twice, mm. uh, more than one hundred twenty percent increase. Then you have, look at the second big crop of uh, wheat. This is crossing, uh, the, even beating the previous record and doing more than 28 billion. Similarly, rice has increased by 18%, but, but exports will be beating, for the first time, 3 billion mark. So you see, that's, that's what agriculture. Then you look at uh, FBR. They were always behind the target, whatever, because IMF mm. always set up very... They uh, want to us to increase the tax net, basically. They always asked. Mm. But this time, the FBR is ahead of them. All right. So, you know, this... Uh, and the good news is that despite a fall in imports, normally a lot of revenue comes from imports. But this time, it's the real um, increase because it's increase in income tax. It's increase in sales tax and federal excise duty. And it's not through an international trade, you know, so that, that's a real increase. Mm. So that's the second good thing. But the other, I think, the, one of the things market may be taking into account is that we were almost, uh, you know, the, the circular debt on account of our energy prices, especially gas and electricity, was going beyond uh, control. I mean, mm. <laughs> any, anything, mm. any. PSO or all these things, uh, big companies could have just conked off. Mm -hmm. But uh, that has been controlled. Uh, you know, we they increased um, uh, this 
increased petroleum price, but then with the fall, we, because we, uh, I think the government felt confident that now they can even decrease it. Mm. So they have decreased it, and despite that, petroleum levy has is, is record. I mean, mm. it's, it's really mm. jumped up. And the the big problem was about gas prices. What do you do? Mm. And and mo just a couple of weeks ago, I think they decided to to bring them at uh, at market level. So th so there's. Uh, Many, many of these these mm. good news. That's being reflected by stock stock market. Stock market always looks forward. What's going to happen over mm. the next you know mm. few months, and that's reflected in stock market. That's that's what's happening there. The IMF is also talking a lot. Has talked about subsidies or removing the subsidies as well. And Pakistan has, I think, has done most of the needful. Do you think more needs to be done from the Pakistani side? Sure, sure. A lot more needs to be done. Perhaps there, there's enough time. But I think um, I read somewhere the finance minister saying that in a year we pay about 500 billion mm -hmm. rupees for these state-owned uh, enterprises. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I think they're seriously, seriously, they have worked on some of the most uh, loss uh, incurring organization. You, you see every day there's some progress on at least Pakistan International mm -hmm. Alliance. They just uh, got a financial advisor for that. and. And it's, it's seriously going going forward, and also the other big loss was uh, you know the steel mill was closed for many years now, 2015 I think mm. it closed and it's already eight years, but they were not able to get rid of staff. They still had you know more than 3,000 employees, and now they started laying them off. So they are making progress even mm. there. So they, these were the big subsidies. Mm. Uh, I mean where, where subsidies were going. Do you feel other avenues will also be discussed in this meeting between the IMF and the government uh, stakeholders because there's the FBR, there's the Ministry of Finance, the State Bank of Pakistan that are all privy to these meetings. Uh, what, in your point of view, will be the major concerns as far as the IMF is concerned? I think IMF would always have some concern that, you know, you could have even more revenues. Hmm. And uh, and and also when when Pakistan was getting this this loan, there was still some conditionality that you have to get some f uh, some more funding from your, from your friendly countries, and uh, uh, that is still some of it is still not materialized, mm. and also there was some hope that this uh, commitment in Geneva for this climate uh, disaster we had those floods etc you know nine ten billion. Mm and not not even a third of that has materialized. But there's a talk of uh, Pakistan adhering to the different uh, methodologies as per, uh, you know, put forward by the different authorities so that the money can start uh, pouring in. Uh, well, I think Pakistan is doing the needful, if I'm not wrong. Pakistan is, sorry. Doing the needful as far as, you know, these uh, yes, yes, conditionalities I mean, that have Pakistan been put forward. Has, uh, is uh, I think in 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 all all these areas they 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 you know it's the usual political pressures are not there mm. and uh, recently uh, while working on this task force and tax reform I had a lot of connections with the government I used, you know and I could see them they're working 24 hours mm. I mean you know they'll call meetings at 11 seven in the morning so. There's a lot of work going on in various sectors, mm. yes. Do you feel a significant progress has been made as far as the tax reforms are concerned? Yes, yes. I mean, soon you will see, um, I think, some major assignments. So, so they set up this task force as to how to expand the income tax, uh, the, the, the base, you know, because it's very small. It's, you know, at least double or triple. That was uh, one side. Then there was a lot of losses on the uh, on the sales tax side because uh, there will be fake invoices and uh, you know there will mm. be uh, not yeah. enough connection and and uh, you know how do we connect with the point of sales uh, and and then collecting of uh, uh, sales tax that's mm. happening and the third can we see fixed tra taxations for example for retailers and potential real estate I, uh, I think I think issues. it's coming let's okay. see let's okay. see if the government uh, can success but. This time, I think they're they're more prepared. They have a certain formula. It's not like previously that everyone pays a certain amount. Mm -hmm. This time, they're looking at, okay, where is the shop located? How much is the rent? Is it mm -hmm. in the in the you know in, let's say F6 in Islamabad, mm -hmm. or is it in some 
rural area are far off. So they're accordingly uh, okay, they're adjusting, adjusting it accordingly. Adjusting it accordingly. This okay. So there's a lot of uh, common sense hmm. as to what they're asking this time. And and the other thing I forgot about uh, when, when I mentioned about uh, uh, income tax and uh, sales tax, uh, there was the third uh, big uh, source of revenue is the you know uh, from international trade and from from custom duty. Hmm. And they have taken some very serious steps for uh, uh, minimizing uh, mm, smuggling. And also there was a lot of misinvoicing, misinvoicing, under invoicing. Okay. They, they, so they, they're doing something very serious. They, they, they've uh, put up a plan for that. And I think you'll, you'll hear about it in, in a week's time. All right. The role of the Special Investment Facilitation Council, is it important in the whole context of these meetings with the IMF, also uh, with the, the conditionalities that have been put forward as far as the climate resilient investments are concerned? Yes, uh, it is because uh, many of our foreign friends and investors and, and foreign direct investment, etc., kind of they were losing trust in mm. government's uh, commitment to deliver. But with SIFC, the thing there, there is and this already happening that the scenes are much faster than you see. A lot mm. of red tape has been mm. cut down. A facilitation uh, process is in progress as yes. to you know uh, yes. improve the working conditions for all those investors who want to come yes. and uh, work in Pakistan. Yes, yes. That's okay. why the, uh, I think this year, I don't remember the ex exact figure, but investment uh, figure compared to mm. this quarter, compared to last quarter, I think it's about 15% or whatever, it's up. Okay, wonderful. Also, pa one of the reports says that Pakistan has to achieve a primary uh, uh, surplus, which is the difference between the total revenues and expenditures, except for interest payments, at about 4% of the GDP. Yeah. Uh, is that achievable? Yes, not only achievable, it's been, you know, it's already we are there. Mm. Because they said that you should achieve at least uh, 87 billion. And my figures show that uh, there were surplus, primary surpluses, 417 billion. So, so they're already there. Okay. What about the uh, primary balance and the tight squeeze on it as far as the PS, uh, PSDP is concerned or the subsidies are concerned? Do you feel we are, the amount is uh, what has been expected or what is anticipated by uh, lending on organizations such as the IMF? I, I think more or less all these targets, uh, I haven't really heard anything negative. Mm. They, they are within reach. I think all these uh, key uh, departments, State Bank, FPR, and the Ministry of Finance, they all come up with this, you know, that, that they have met the various targets. I mean, there was a, I mean it, was, it was rather difficult to keep this uh, tight monetary policy of 22% uh, interest rate because there's a lot of pressure for reducing it, but they kept it on. Mm. So, you know, I think, I think they've achieved most of the targets. All right. But uh, do you feel Pakistan in the coming months, if it continues in the same vein, can come out of A, the circular debt, and B, uh, its equation with the lending organizations? Well, it has to, it's, it's too early. Mm. It's only a few months mm. that these positive news has started coming in because after, you know, 14 months we had uh, even this primary surplus etc were on the negative mm -hmm. side so we, we we started moving so i do hope but but they have to keep up this uh, reform pressure and not go back to the old ways of uh, you know subsidies and and all that so it's, uh, yeah. There's also another concern that, of course, the government is complying with and that uh, concerns the containing of the development programs at the provincial and the federal levels. Uh, is the IMF content with the way Pakistan's government has been moving forward on that? Uh, according to, you know, I don't have inside information, mm. but what I see in the press, that in general, they are, they are content with mm. what's happening, yes. Right. And, and, and also, I think, uh, you see, Previously, there was very little coordination between the provincial governments and the federal governments, and many areas, even even in taxation. And now, they, 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 this this gap is is closing. I think. When you look at the gap closing, how also important is the continuity of these same policies that have yielded such extraordinary results in these few months? 
of post elections when whichever government uh, comes comes into power that it continues with the same policies well it's, it's not easy to it's a million dollar question is it is a, a foresee the future hmm. but you see the difficult decisions which 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 normally a political government is afraid to take right? like uh, you know energy uh, prices uh, taking mm. them to the to a realistic level and those decisions have been taken mm. and more difficult decisions are being taken now i mean they, right. they are you know every day every week so so mm. so i think it would be relatively easier for the political government they would not be expected to they'll just be expected to keep on with that and the decisions would have already been taken if i were to ask you finally uh, dr sab if the tranche uh, the new the second tranche that has to be released from the spa will uh, actually happen in the coming days how optimistic are you for that yeah i'm very optimistic it's, it's uh, you know it's 700 million dollars i mm -hmm. think i think we'll get it and we'll go to the next one so okay. and and also the fact that imf and world bank they were didn't really expect pakistan gdp growth you know they they said well last time also you said something like it was a half a percentage mm. Uh, mm. growth but there wasn't really a growth it was negative mm. but now they've revised their figures you know they were expecting that uh, this year maybe one but they're already two and a half to three and a half percent same with world bank and for the year after it's even they're thinking about five percent Okay. So this is, I mean, they, what they were thinking will happen in 28. Now they're thinking will happen in 25, okay. 24. Yes. Wonderful. So we are going above and beyond expectations, yes, to say the yes, least. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Manzoor Ahmed, trade arbitrator with the WTO, to have joined us and to have also given us an insight on the different talks regarding uh, the taxation uh, that are uh, going on. And let's see how positive results are also yielded in the coming weeks as well. And how important uh, is, the, of course, the continuity of all these policies that we have seen such extraordinary results of in these last few months. Thank you very much, sir. To have Thank you today. for allowing, for giving me this opportunity to share this. No, no, no. The pleasure all is all ours. So this is what our audience also wants to have an update as far as our economic situation is concerned. Kindly uh, stay seated. We are just going to end the show in about five minutes. Let's come to the last uh, two stories. Ladies and gentlemen, the first concerns the anti-India protests that have been happening in Kargil and Ladakh. Nothing new there, but the fact also remains that just like Palestine, uh, the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir is also going through similar things, whether it be the rapes, the murders, the incarceration, the uh, jailing of the of the leaders, the muting of the voices, any sane voice, the the impact on the journalists that uh, try to uh, tell the truth as far as what is happening in the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir region. This and so much more is happening in the Indian held valley exactly as a replica of what is happening in Palestine. But the Kashmiris are protesting against these Indian uh, atrocities and the protesters have said, I'd like to quote one or two of those quotes that if India can't give us our rights, let us go to Pakistan. Children here are starving without food and water. We don't need a country where we are so oppressed. They have locked the entire area for three days, not letting us go anywhere. This is the unfortunate truth that is happening as far as people are concerned. But the fact is that they need to be given the right to uh, self-determination, the right to decide what they want to do with their lives. That is what they are protesting for. And that is what needs to be given to them under any human rights law and under so many resolutions that have been passed uh, uh, at the United Nations. So let's see where all of this leads to. Finally, we are going to talk about three Indian cities who are uh, now uh, amongst the world's 10 most polluted cities after Diwali. We know that Diwali is the festival of lights and there's a lot of uh, firecrackers that are used. So that adds to the smog, that adds to the pollution in the air. Now, first there was just New Delhi, that was one of the cities, you know, that was uh, affected by air pollution. But now there are two more cities that have been added to the list, and those are Kolkata and Mumbai. If you just look at the figures in AQI level of 400 to 500 impacts healthy people, dangerous to those with existing diseases, uh, level of 150 to 200 brings discomfort to people with asthma, lung and lung, uh, heart problems. What is the level as far as the AQI figures as far as New Delhi is concerned? It's four 420. Kolkata uh, is 196. Mumbai is 163. Every year, of course, their government tries to impose some kind of restriction as far as firecrackers are concerned, but the people never understand or they never comply with uh, those. Uh, 
let's see what happens this time whether there will be more strict uh, decisions that will be taken post uh, this uh, new revelation that has been made as far as air pollution in three cities in India is concerned. Air pollution is of course extremely bad for health and this needs to be curbed as much as possible. With that ladies and gentlemen we come to an end of today's news and we'll see you inshallah tomorrow with news stories have been to us you in Pakistan. Stay tuned, stay informed. Allah Hafiz.